So I'm going to talk about tools to visualize as uh, sequencing data. And this talk is largely inspired by what Sir, Dr. Serna Morrissey developed a few years ago, and I just uh, updated it a bit. Um, so what do we want to learn in this module is to appreciate the different data type uh, tools, data visualization tools in genomics. Um, to know when to use a particular tool, to get more experience on genome browser, which I mentioned a few, and uh, to become an expert in variation inspection, uh, specifically in a single nucleotide and structural variants. So briefly, we're going to, part one is about visualization tools, uh, genome browser, and an IGV overview. And then we're going to look at example of how to visualize single nucleotide polymorphism and structural variant. Um, first. Why do we want to visualize our data? Um, it's quite an important thing to do, and actually you should spend time looking at your data. And we can take an example of this um, uh, data set, quite famous data set. So it's four different data sets, which um, is composed of X and Y values. And if you do a simple metric as you used to do uh, for many data sets, you would have the same average value for Y across the four data sets. <coughs> The variance correlation between x and y is the same as well, and you can even do a linear regression and that would give you pretty much the same answer. However, if you plot it, it's pretty obvious that those four data sets are not the same. The first one is um, as a linear relation, there is a relationship between x and y as a linear way. The second is still a relationship between x and y, but it's not a linear um, <coughs> relationship. It's, um, as you can observe on the plot, there is actually a curve. The third one <coughs> has a perfect linear, linear relationship, but has one outlier. So in this case, you would do a more robust linear regression and actually ignore the outlier properly. And the last one, there is actually no relationship between X and Y, and just an outlier would drive the correlation. So visualizing your data would help you to spot that and maybe use different metric or um, um, process the data differently. So we have two types of visual processing. We have the pre-attentive and the attentive visual processing. The pre-attentive is the one that's going to allow you to actually spot Charlie, actually Waldo here, on the left part of the plot very easily. The first thing you notice right away. And then you would use your attentive visual processing to actually find it on the bit on the right. So we want to use our, our pre-attentive uh, brain tool, I would say, to actually spot outliers. So uh, encoded properly using pre-attentive attributes, outlier can easily be identified visually. As you can see on this, uh, <coughs> on this small plot, you can, everyone can spot very easily the outlier in every single little graph. Um, so why do we realize we can claim that human, the human visual system is actually a low cost and high performance to sense as a sense marker and as a debugger to identify pattern and to identify issue and outliers as compared to uh, writing the code, the, the code debugging and running a many scripts to actually, and sometimes it could be quite hard to have an idea of what you're looking for as an outlier if you, you never come across to them. We, there are different genome browsers available out there, um, um, over 40 of them, and it really depends on what you want to do of which one you're going to use. The task at hand, are you using uh, human data, <coughs> different plant data? Uh, some genome browsers are specific to particular species. Um, the kind of data and the size of data you're dealing with, and if there is issue in terms of privacy of your data, can you use it on, do you have to use it on your protected uh, server in your institute, or can you use it a uh, cloud-based one? And so those are considerations you need to take into account when you choose which genome browser to uh, use and you can actually use several of them that would uh, bring you different information in function of your project and your question of interest. For us, as you can see, uh, throughput data, um, I'm naming a few genome browsers here. So, Integrative uh, Genome Viewer, we're going to use today, that I'm going to uh, present in more detail just after, and we're going to use today in the lab practical. Uh, UCSC uh, is, uh, is a famous genome browser. You can load your own data as well and have your own track display on the, G um, on the UCSC website. Um, Trackstar, as part of Galaxy, allows you to perform visual analytics on a small window of the genome. Um, and it's part of this big uh, galaxy, which is um, 
project and tool which allow you to perform analysis without actually writing the script by hand but more like a, as an option for every single tool so that could be really interesting for someone that doesn't want to code so much but still want to analyze his own data and i mentioned as well the seven genome browser which has the particularity of allowing to visualize your data but do as well some uh, analysis so when you have a variant you actually can run something as part of seven to look to identify this variant as has already been found in another <coughs> cohort or to try to predict the effect of this variant, which uh, NiGV wouldn't allow you to do that. You would use other tool to do that. So what about the integrated gene genome viewer? It's from the Broad Institute. And I just want to mention that the slide with the Broad logo at the very top that is actually cut on the screen <laughs> has been largely uh, <laughs> Use uh, um, I borrow them from the IGV tutorial from the broad, and uh, so I reuse their mat material. It's provided by them at the beginning. So it's a high performance vision tool for interactive exploring larger da data. Uh, it's allow you to support array based and sequencing based data as well as genomic annotation. So it's a desktop application for interactive visual exploration of integrated genomic data set. Um, you can load many different types of data in IGV, and these are two, um, an example of a few, such as epigenome, epigenomic tracks, um, histone mark, for example, um, some macro data that we are still a lot out there, a lot of public data you can actually download and display like this. <coughs> We're going to look at some uh, alignment of sequencing read. Um, you can display your aeronistic alignment as well uh, to look at the expression of particular gene or copy number calls um, when you've done your copy number uh, analysis, for example. Um, with IGV, you can explore large genomic data sets with an intuitive and easy to use interface. You can integrate multiple types of data and as well clinical or the sample information, what you know about your different sample. And you're going to view data from multiple sources uh, locally, from remote or cloud based. It depends on what you want to do and your project. Um, there is as well the possibility of um, using a command line interface and write on a script to actually um, ask IGV to launch IGV and ask IGV to go to a particular location, um, do something, take a screenshot of this location, and then go to the next location and do it again. And so you can do that automatically for hundreds of positions. And that could be a very good way of uh, reviewing the particular SNP score that you had. Um, in some projects, you will roll, you will run different SNP scholar and which are going to agree on many positions, but will disagree on many other positions, and you would want to actually look at those to figure out, oh, is that, was it a true call from this scholar, or if it's, it's not a true call, and I should not consider it. So that could be a good way of actually viewing a lot of screenshots um, efficiently. Um, and this is not in the tutorial, but uh, it, um, I can provide you information with that if you're interested. Um, so IGB, the source of that, the, the type of that, the, where the data can be used from when you load on the GV, sorry. Um, you can get data from the from server, from the Amazon cloud, um, the data that you store locally on your computer. Uh, you can use as well a public data set, like, such as the TCG. So you can view local file without uploading it, uploading. And you can view remote file without downloading the whole data set. So that keep, keep it uh, easier to actually not need a huge amount of memory on your laptop, but you can still view um, large um, data sets in this way. Um, so the basic of IGV, you will load the IGV, you will select your reference genome. You would load the data and then you would nav navigate through the data going a particular location. And for whole genome da uh, sequencing data, you would specifically look at SNVs and structural variants, which we're going to do in the tutorial just after. Um, <coughs> we're going on the website. You probably did that already because you're supposed to have installed IGV. Um, you're going to go to the download page and download it <coughs> and be able to install it on your computer. Um, so the IGV uh, screen looks like this. So the first thing uh, you need to do is to select the genome you, uh, you of, you of interest for you with the drop-down menu, and then you will load your data. Uh, to load your data, you will go to File Load. You can use from the server or from your own file. And uh, this is an example of how to use uh, 
public and training data, which is already part of IGV, but you can, we will be loading our old small, small BAM in the tutorial. And uh, so the, when you have loaded your data, this is how it might look like, or it will look different in function of the data type you're actually loading. And just to give you the overview, what are the different panels? So at the top, of course, you have the menu, then the toolbar, which some um, important feature we're gonna uh, go through, especially this little um, yellow sticky thing <laughs> um, that, uh, yeah, here, yeah, this one, that allow you to inactive the fact that you have information that's gonna display all the time you're moving your mouse, so that's something, you, and you only want it on the click usually, so that's one of the first things we do when we open IGV for the first time. You will experience it. Uh, if you never use IGV, you would experience it in the lab, in the tutorial just after that. So here we have the genome ruler. This is the human genome, chromosome 1 to 22, X and Y. And you can go to a particular location, um, putting your location in this box, or actually typing the name of the gene of interest in this box. And uh, you would directly go to the, the right location. This is a track number with a sample name, <coughs> the file you're loading. Um, then you can, if you loaded an attribute file, you would have a color code for your different information of the sample. It can be um, the sex of the sample, of the patient of the sample you sequence, or the subgroup of the particular cancer type you sequence, or whatever clinical or the information you have on your data. Um, then the track which uh, you read or your enrichment code, and the genome, was a, a genome feature at the bottom, uh, which when you zoom in, you will see the, actually the gene display, as you would see in a normal genome browser. And you can have load more information, uh, type of information like the GC content of the genome or the repeats uh, that are annotated on the genome, and there are all different tracks you, uh, you can load as well. Um, so what type of file formats uh, can you actually load? Uh, many of them. <laughs> and the file format actually defines the track type um, and the track type determines the display option. So IGB is no, going to recognize uh, <coughs> sorry, which uh, file format you're actually loading and will display your, um, your data in a particular way in function of what it is. So if it's a BAM, it will already know, oh, I'm looking for read, I'm looking for the quality of the read, I'm looking for the quality of this particular base uh, in the read, and I'm going to display it in a particular way. And the full list of the different data types supported uh, at, at the, on the link at the bottom. So when we have uh, whole genome data, we want to use the alignment. Um, if you look at the chromosome at the beginning, you won't see anything because you actually your window is way too large and you cannot load everything. So it will tell you zoom in to see alignment. So how much do you need to zoom in to actually see something? Well, it really depends of what is your data, but roughly 30 KB is a, a <coughs> um, region which is okay to start looking at some, uh, being able to visualize your read, for example, but it really depends on how deep is your coverage. So the more, um, the larger the window, the more memory is gonna uh, need to actually be able to display it. And if you have even deeper, very deep coverage, then it's even more memory. So in function of how, big is your coverage and <coughs> and the memory you can actually have on your laptop, you will need to go a smaller windows to be able to see it, to see your bits. So when we zoom in, we can start looking at alignment. Um, if the base inside the read match the reference, they are not colored. If they don't match the reference, they're gonna start being colored and looking at um, blue, red, et cetera, et cetera. So if you start loading your, your BAM file and then everything is like a rainbow, it's probably that you didn't <laughs> load the right reference genomes. Um, if it's mainly gray and then there are a few uh, colors, that makes more sense. So we're actually gonna look at those bases that are color and that's actually gonna be the one that of our interest, specifically for, specifically for SNPs. Um, so what are some, what are the metrics um, that can be used to evaluate the validity of a SNPs? Um, the first one is the coverage, then the amount of support. Is there an SBS that you can actually um, uh, detect a strand base of PCR artifact? What is the mapping quality and what is the base quality? And all these things can actually be viewed or highlighted with different uh, IGV options. 
Um, for structural variants, we're going to look at coverage, ancestral intent, and read pair orientation, which I'm going to explain in detail just after. So if we want to review a SNP or an SNV, here we had an example of a particular SNP. So we will center our IGB screen screens at this particular location, which is affected by the dotted black line. So that's where you're, going to um, you're really interested. You can see here that you have some T, red T display on the screen. So all the reads that are actually still gray, that means it matches the reference genome, which is a C. All the reads that are actually have the T later, that means the read has a, an alternative <coughs> base, which is a T here. And you can see at the top, this is a, the coverage track here, that is roughly an heterozygous uh, mutation uh, call, which have 50% of the reference and 50% a bit less um, of the alternates, actually more of the, of the T here. Um, you can notice as well some T are actually have a darker red and some are actually lighter. This is a way to encode the base quality. So if you have strong uh, T letters or AOC letters, I mean you would you would trust it. If it's not as strong and a blend or fader, I'm not sure how to call it, um, you would say, oh, actually, I would not trust it as much as, as this one, for example. Um, so, for example, this were a SNP call by a caller. We can color the read in a particular way as well. So here we color the reads that all the reads that are on the forward strand in red, the read on the reverse strand in blue, and you can see on this particular SNPs on the only the reads that are going in this direction have the alternative LM, and none of the red one have it. I would be a need that there is a strand bias that uh, this this mutation or this variant is actually may not be a true one, but could be a, a, an effect, a side effect of the sequencing. Not a, yeah. And you observe as well that most of them are actually at the end of the read, as this uh, as Jared, uh, described earlier. The end of the read are, <coughs> are more prone to error, and is what's one of the patterns you can see here. So you would not trust this um, being a, a C, uh, an SNB for C, a SNP for C here. Um, so we want to look at structural, uh, view structural events as well. And uh, now we have pair reads, pair hand reads. So uh, we can, uh, yell, this can yell evident for genomal structural events, just uh, deletion, translocation, and inversion. So we want to color this pair in a particular way to help us to identify this structural variant. And for this, we can look at the infer insert site, which is gonna, I'm going to describe just after, and the pair orientation. So what you expect is this inward-facing pair orientation, but sometimes you have other ones, and that's going to help you to figure to identify a structural event. So the pair uh, and sequencing, <laughs> you probably um, seen that before. So you have your DNA that you're going to cut in, into fragments and you're going to sequence um, and you would have read from both hands and roughly the, <coughs> the insert side between this read is roughly the same for all your library which is, uh, it tends to be something like 300 or 400 bits per. Um, so when you uh, actually, you have your pair uh, reads, when you actually map them on your reference um, genome, you would be able to infer the distance between your pair. And this, in most of, most of the pair in your, in your library, you would have roughly the same distance, but some would be a lot further apart, a lot uh, closer apart, and it would allow you to detect structural variant. You're going to go through the detection of those variants in detail tomorrow, how to actually, which tool to use and how to detect them, but we can uh, start visualizing uh, them and see what are the evidence uh, when, uh, when we look at the pairs. Um, <coughs> so, um, so we can interpret the inference size uh, and we can actually detect deletion and insertion as well as uh, interchromosomal rearrangement. Basically, if you can, if you, if you have a rearrangement between two chromosomes, uh, the inference size is not going to be able to uh, insert size, not going to be able to be computed because it's actually on two different chromosomes, so it's going to be indefined, and that could be an evidence that you actually this part of the genome, which has been linked to this part of the genome, that was you have a period on between chromosome one and twelve, for example. 
So that could be a clue for other chromosomal rearrangement. Um, the other two deletion and instruction, you will be able to um, spot them with a, a shorter or larger insert size than expected. So we're going to see this example of the deletion. So what is the effect of a deletion on the inference and size? Um, so here is your reference genome, and in the sample you actually sequence, um, there is a deletion of the red part in the middle. So that would look like this. Um, when you're going to cut your DNA and do your pair hand sequencing, you would have, you'll have reads um, mapping on your subject like at the bottom next to the junction. But when you map those reads back to the reference genome, they're going to be a lot further apart. So the insert size, uh, infer insert size we're going to be larger than expected, larger than most of your read pair in your library. And we can color that in IGV to actually um, be able to identify it more easily. And um, you would have a menu, you can color by insert size. Uh, we will do that in the practical. And a deletion could look like this. So you would have red, um, paired, read at the edge of the deletion. Uh, and you could see a drop in coverage at the, at the uh, breakpoints. So pair with larger than expected denser size would be color in red. And I give you the color code for this. Um, larger is red, shorter is blue. And if there are map, you pair map to different chromosome, it would be a different colors as example here. So for every arrangement, your arrangement might look like this. You would have some pair in a particular position, um, for example, in your tumor, nothing in your, in your normal, that will have this uh, brownish color, which actually indicate you that the mate of this pair is actually mapping to chromosome 6. And on the same, at the location on the chromosome 6, you would see a blue color that would tell you actually the, mate, the other mate called, um, is uh, mapping on chromosome 1. So that would be a, an evidence for rearrangement. How can we interpret read pair orientation um, to actually look at, um, detect, or validate visually uh, innovation, duplication, translocation, and complex rearrangement? Um, um, so for this, for the read pair orientation, which I'm going to display just after, we talk about the read strand left to right and the read order first to second. Um, so we will display the read pair orientation uh, in, um, in function of different case, uh, for different cases that going to allow us to find for uh, to actually display inversion, for example. Um, so we have the reference genome. You know? uh, there is a sequence A to B um, that actually going to be inverted into the sample U sequence, which will look like this. You will cut your DNA and do the parent sequencing, and some pair would actually spam the junction at the B position and spam the junction at the A position, such as the first one at the B location. When you then map your read to your reference genome, the part here, the read that map to the blue part will map properly here. However, the read that map to this part that has been inverted would not map here, but rather here. And you can observe that the pair orientation is not anymore like this, but like this, going to both in the same direction. If you have pair reads for the pairs that are going to map this other breakpoint uh, at the A position, that would be what has been sequenced from your sample. And when you map it, you would have a, a read that is in the blue part on the right, which has no problem to be mapped as you expect. And oops, well, yeah, that's right. And the second uh, um, pair read would actually be mapped going to the A here. So you would see that you have pair orientation that is not what you expect, like you expect the inward facing one, but rather you have the left side pair and the right side pair, um, which can be colored uh, in a particular way. In IGV, it would be cyan and blue. So we can go to the IGV and color by pair orientation, as you can see here. And an inversion would look like this. So at each breakpoint, you would have some um, cyan and blue um, mate pair. And you can notice a drop in coverage at the breakpoint as well. Yeah. So, so in uh, RNA sequencing analysis, to identify splice junctions, some algorithm split the read, mm -hmm. um, they, they try to do multiple alignments of the read with the assumption that it must be a gap yeah. alignment. 
So could you, you, could you do a similar thing here? Do you take the unaligned reads, presumably because they lie across these unique splicing events in the genome, and could you split them into time? Yes, so the the way IGV is going to display, well, you're going to load your band, so the alignment is gonna, will have been done by your alignment that is aware of the splicing for RNA-seq. And then it's going to be displayed, you're going to have a, um, a gray box, then a line, then another gray box. So that means your read actually been mapping at these two positions. But you know it's the same read. Right. So that's how IGV is going to display it. Uh, but IGV not going to... It's just a visual digital. It's not going to be able to map it properly. You will have to do it properly to get your BAM file with a, with a uh, aligner that is aware of. But yeah, IGV is able to um, to display it properly, as you would expect on the exam. Yes? So, so each read of a paradigm read is independently aligned? Is that Yes. You will do that this afternoon in the practical when we look at... Uh, yeah. So these are the different type of category of read pair orientation, uh, the normal one at the top, and you have the L, L, and R, R, which are evidence for inversions, um, which are um, like left or right. Um, and then you have the R, L, uh, which would be evidence for duplication or translocation. Both of them could actually have this pattern of outward facing. Um, and that's it for the lecture part. Mm -hmm.